We're now going to move from the subject of phonology to the subject of morphology. And we're going to consider two types of morphemes, bound morphemes and free morphemes. Now, first we have to establish exactly what morphology is. Now, you remember that phonemes were the smallest parts of speech, the parts of, of, of speech, or of language, I should say, that on their own don't mean anything. Well, now we're going to move to the meaningful parts. So phonemes are put together in ways that predictably mean things, that are used, um, that, are rec that have recognizable meanings. So when we think about, uh, I don't know, the T sound in English, it doesn't have a recognizable meaning. But when we look at the ER sound, the ER sound in English, then we say, wait, that does have a recognizable meaning because when it's put at the end of an adjective, like pretty, pretty ER, or big, big ger, then we notice that that predictably means a comparison. Or when it's put at the end of a verb, like dance, dance ER, or uh, sing, sing ER, then we notice that it means the person who does something. So we say, oh, when those phonemes, the building blocks, are put together, into um, meaningful patterns, patterns that always represent these, these same um, ideas, then we say they are morphemes. So morphemes can be considered uh, in two different categories. Free morphemes are morphemes that can be used on their own to have meaning. We call these words or signs. I don't need to say anything else other than book for you to have the idea of a book, or other than uh, sit for you to have the idea of sit. By themselves, they can occur. Book can be used alone. Sit can be used alone. But other morphemes can't be used alone. You have to use them in a context. They have to be attached to particular morphemes. For instance, the ER morpheme that we were talking about in English, you can't just say er to mean more. No, it has to come and be attached to, to another word. It has to be attached to pretty or to big. And then once it's attached together, then you could use it. Prettier, bigger. These morphemes are what are called bound morphemes. They're morphemes that cannot be used alone. They have to be bound to or attached to other morphemes. And just as we have free and bound morphemes in spoken language, we have free and bound morphemes in sign languages as well. Now, we can further divide free morphemes and bound morphemes into categories. Free morphemes can be divided into well, different types of words that can be used. Since free morphemes are, by and large, words, then we can say free morphemes can be nouns or adjectives or adverbs or verbs. And bound morphemes can also be divided into particular types. We have inflectional morphemes, which are grammatical morphemes, and derivational morphemes, which are grammatical morphemes that change the part of speech. And inflectional morphemes don't change the part of speech, whereas derivational morphemes do. So we'll take a look at that in just a moment. Let's first go back to these free morphemes and consider different types of free morphemes. Now, you might need to go back to your grammar book to uh, refamiliarize yourself with, with parts of speech. We have nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, conjunctions, interjections. You're also going to learn about a few other types of parts of speech. For example, determiners, uh, which you probably have never heard of before because uh, most uh, English grammar classes don't cover them. But remember, these are just instances of free morphemes, morphemes that can be used on their own. And we call them words or signs. Bound morphemes in spoken language can either come before, in the middle of, or at the end of, uh, of free morphemes. So you can take the word arrange, which is a free morpheme, and put a prefix to it, rearrange or prearrange, or you can put a suffix on it, arrangement. You can also put a uh, sometimes uh, an infix, which is um, pretty rare in English. We actually tend to only use curse words that we sort of put in the middle of other, uh, of other words. So we'll say something like, pardon my language, unfucking believable And you put that infix in the middle of a word. These are just different ways that bound morphemes can be used in spoken languages, before, in the middle of, or at the end of. Now, as I mentioned, bound morphemes come in two types. Derivational morphemes change the part of speech. So if you have a verb, like relax, then you can add the ending shun, or sometimes ation, and that will change the verb into a noun. Relax becomes relaxation. Create becomes creation. And populate becomes population. So by adding the shun, 
where the ation at the end of a word, you change it from a verb to a noun. That's a derivational morpheme. It changes the part of speech. Now, inflectional morphemes don't change the part of speech, but they assign some particular grammatical property to the word. In English, for instance, we have the S ending that we use to make nouns plural, or we have the ing sound that we add to verbs to take run and change it to running, or the ed sound that changes walk into walked to make the past tense. These are inflectional endings. If you ever took Spanish, you probably learned lots of inflectional endings as you were learning the, the verb endings of uh, I love, you love, he loves, amo, amas, ama, or in the past tense, ame, amas, te amo. These various endings that change the meaning of the word or that change the particular grammatical property of the word, these are inflectional morphemes. So, you might think, well, ASL doesn't have any of these things. I understand how ASL has uh, free morphemes. It has individual signs that function like words, but it wouldn't have any of these bound morphemes, either derivational or inflectional. I wouldn't know how to even recognize those. But it turns out ASL does have bound morphemes. Let's take a look at a few of them. Notice how in verbs you can change the movement of the verb. So you can sign the sign to go, or you can repeat that movement in a back and forth motion, which means to go again and again. Or you can make a circular movement, or add a circular movement to a verb. So you can take the verb to work, but if you sign it with a large circular movement, it means to work for a long time. So these movements that can be assigned to verbs are bound inflectional morphemes. They're inflectional because they don't change the part of speech, but they're bound because uh, they have to be used as a part of the free morpheme work. You can't just do the circular movement on its own to mean for a long time. It has to be part of the verb to work. You can't just do the back and forth movement of go to mean for a long time. You have to sign go with the back and forth movement as a part of it. The movement is incorporated or bound into the, the sign. And that's why we say that movements of verbs are inflectional. Another bound inflectional morpheme are the facial markers that we can add to verbs. So we can add the, the tongue out or the bared teeth. And each of these changes the, uh, the grammatical use of the verb without changing the part of speech. Similarly, with adjectives, we can change both the movement or the facial expression of the adjective. So you can sign um, to be sick, or if you do this with a tense movement that then goes quickly, to be very sick. You can sign fast, or if you go from tense to quick, very fast. Similarly, you can change the movement, the meaning of adjectives. For example, you can sign big with the cha facial expression to mean very big, or with the... Um, the facial expression that shows uh, just the lips pursed together, which means sort of big. Now these have all been inflectional morphemes, but in ASL we also have derivational morphemes, morphemes that change the part of speech. For instance, if you take a verb, like the verb to sit, and make it with a smaller double movement, then you've created the noun, chair. If you take the verb fly, which is a big movement, and you do it in a quick, small movement, then you, ch you change fly to airplane. So by changing the movement, you've added a bound morpheme to the sign fly, and you've changed the part of speech, which is why we say it's a derivational morpheme. You've made a verb, fly, into a noun, airplane. Another derivational um, morpheme that we we have is the person marker dance dance er now up until recently this was a bound morpheme because no one used that sign that person marker um alone it, it, it was it was it had to be bound so you couldn't just sign it that way you had to sign it with p's and if you signed it with p's then it meant person but if you signed it with just the straight hands it had to be used with a verb dancer teach er learner um, but people have, have sort of revived an older use of that sign, and so now they use that sign alone. So I'm not sure that we can still consider it a bound morpheme because it can be used by itself to just mean person now, even though uh, 30 years ago it was never used on its own. So 
we will still consider that a derivational bound morpheme, but it's a little questionable because sometimes it's used alone now. So maybe that person marker can be considered a free morpheme now. That's okay. Languages change, and the, the, the category of um, morphemes change as well as the language evolves.